While the series has been absent for six years, Portland International Raceway was often host to some classic Trans Am battles. In 1990, Trans Am whiz kid Darren Brassfield took the win. 91 saw the war intensify and the wily speed of Irv Hare brought him home first. Sweetness switched helmets in 92 while veteran Paul Genelosi came from 19 to score. The battle went to mano a mano in 93 between the Camaro of pole sitter Scott Sharp and Ron Fellows Mustang with Fellows using the old chrome horn on his way to victory. Fellows notched win number two from the pole in 94 and he got his third straight in the reign of 1995. Now, six years later, the look may be different, but little else. The fury and the fire remain as heated as ever. The pressure equally intense. The Warriors of Trans Am return to Portland International Raceway next, live on Speed Vision. For the first time since 1995, the Trans Am Series for the BF Goodrich Tires Cup returns to Portland International Raceway for the seventh round of the championship chase. Hi everybody, I'm Greg Creamer and welcome to the Tommy Bahama 125. Now, at 125 miles, this seventh round is also one of three scheduled pit stop races that we're gonna see unfold during the season. The first coming at Mosport a few races back. That's a nice development, an even better one, Tommy Kendall returning to Trans Am. Let's quickly take a look at some highlights from TK's early Trans Am career. 1996 falls and six wins on the way to his first of a record four uh, championships. Then in 95, he got another championship. 96, another one still, and in 97, setting the all-time record, 11 consecutive wins, obliterating Mark Donahue's record of eight on his way to his fourth record-setting championship at this point. Indeed, great news to have Tommy Kendall back in Trans Am joining me here in the booth this weekend. TK, welcome back to Trans Am. Well, that is a cruel opening. It was, Probably gave I my know. mother a heart attack, for God's sakes. But um, I'm really excited to be here. I get excited watching a dog show, for God's sake. With everything going on in Trans Am, I am just really pumped. A lot of changes since I was here. The cars are quite a bit different looking with the bodies and the wings and so forth. But the thing that gets me, how about that cash? Paul Genelosi has made almost $50,000 on a number of his wins. Well, those young pups, obviously, you were just born too early. Well, you know, you hear Arnold Palmer say it about Tiger Woods, Will Chamberlain, Michael Jordan. I was clearly born in the wrong era. Back in my day, you'd have to win all the races to make that kind of dough. And, of course, Paul Genelosi winning a lot of the races as of late. You were talking about that. Let's take a look at the driver's points. Genelosi, a bit of a slow start, but then he reeled off three straight leading into Sears Point. He didn't get the win, but he was very competitive. Brian Simmo winning at Sears Point. Popped him up in the second, 14 points behind Genelosi. Johnny Miller, always consistently quick. His third, Lou Gelati, that win at Long Beach and some great runs up to fourth. Michael Lewis, fifth in the points. We'll take a look now at sixth through tenth. And you can see Tommy Archer sits there tied for fifth in the points. Then Bell, Boris said he won at Sebring. Just got the best finish ever for the Panos Esperani in uh, the most recent race at Sears Point. Dreesy and Bob Ruman. Now, we mentioned Tommy Archer. We have a couple of pit reporters here this weekend. Calvin Fish is joining us as well as Chris Neville. And Calvin Calvin, obviously Tommy Archer back this weekend, but he missed Sears Point due to a testing injury, but he is backing in a big way. Well, he's back in a big way, all right, Greg, but he has four cracked ribs that he suffered in that accident. And they say when an animal is wounded, he's sometimes at his meanest. And Tommy Archer yesterday put together a very mean but very smooth qualifying run to claim his first pole position of the year in this Singer Racing Viper. But Tommy, one lap in qualifying is a hurdle for you. How about 65 laps, 125 miles is the body up to the task this afternoon? Well, we're going to find out in a little bit. You know, the, the car is working really well. Sinjo Racing's put together a good team, and I'm really hoping that uh, everything's going to work out good for the for the whole race. And I'd like to say hi to Jacqueline, Andrew, and Pamela, who didn't get to make it to the race. Well, Tommy has finished second here in Trans Am competition two years in 1992 and 1993. He's looking to go one better this afternoon. But a man who has had success here at Portland is standing by with our Chris Neville. Paul Genelosi is once again having a very dominant season in Trans Am. We're six races in. He has won three of them and had four poles in that time. Paul, this weekend has been a little bit different. You're starting second, and you haven't been in top of the practice charts. Are there some problems? Well, no. There, there's always somebody with a paddle big enough to spank your ego, and, and this week Tommy brought it with him. Um, going to be a long race. Lots of stuff's going to happen, Chris. I'm worried about a championship, not one day. 
Good luck out there, Paul. A little bit further back on the grid is Calvin Fish with Boris said. Well, the Pinos Esperanti is really starting to come on strong, Chris. In fact, it finished third at Sears Point with the fastest race lap. And here today at Portland, its highest qualifying position of the year. Boris said, is this car ready to win? Uh, it's getting a lot closer, Calvin. I mean, these guys have been working really hard from Applied Computer Solutions and everyone down at Elan Motorsports. And uh, if not this weekend, maybe the next weekend. Okay, well, Boris thinks he's got a great car underneath him this afternoon. And starting alongside Boris on the second row is champion Brian Simo. He coming off a strong run at Sears Point where he had his first win of the season. It's going to be fun to watch those two guys from the second row. And was it just me or was Tommy Archer dancing around uh, if he's going to last physically for this entire race? You know, when you think about Portland, though, you always think, especially since the early 90s when they instituted the series of chicanes, really, called the Festival Curves, a very tight right left, parks the cars. Tommy, there's always issues with contact there, you know, especially opening laps or restarts. But sometimes there's just issues with improving your position. You ran into that in 1995. A kind of a weird situation. The, the measure has always been, does the car who goes straight improve his position? Here, Dorsey gets it all crossed up, isn't going to make the corner, goes straight through. I go through behind. He rejoins the course. He's quite a bit ahead of me. You'll see he did slow down right up to my bumper. But my argument, which I made over the next 15 laps on the radio, was had he had to go straight, would I have gotten by? My argument was yes, but I, it fell on deaf ears, and they left it as is. And as you mentioned, 15 laps of arguing and pleading, they never saw it your way. So a little later in the race, did you step off the subway and dish out a little vigilante justice? Well, I'm not going to say. I, I'm not smart enough to do something like that. But what I did do, I said, hey, if Dorsey can go to that brake mark that he did, I'm going to try it on the last lap. I get down, way down inside. He's coming inside. I bomb over the curb, end up right in his door, spin him out. Not a real pretty maneuver, obviously. When viewed on hole, my case was that I should have been in front of him already anyways. The real issue is, in the race, if it stays that way, it's in your interest to bomb the chicane every time you're under pressure. But perhaps not anymore. Now, Chris Neville, we understand that issue's been on the boil for some six years, and they may have come up with a, a solution to it this weekend. Yeah, SCCA is saying there will be no bombing of the chicane this weekend. They have an official standing down there, and if you do miss your turn and, and try and go straight, you will be stopped and assessed a 10-second stop-and-go penalty. So many of the drivers are saying they've got to make their turn, and, but on this first lap, a lot of guys are saying if it looks like they're going to get in a wreck, they would rather take that penalty than put the car in the box. And, of course, one of the things you'll wonder about is if somebody is forced on that chicane, will they abrogate a little bit of that penalty or will that entire 10-second stick? We'll see how that unfolds. When we come back, we'll bring you the starting lineup, and then we'll have the start of the seventh round of the Trans Am Series for 2001. Don't go anywhere.